Hey, and thanks for tuning in to this CNCF On Demand webinar in which we will explore how you can build spin apps using .NET 9. My name is Thorsten and I work as a cloud advocate with Fermion. And the most important thing on this slide is my mail address. So if you have any further question, don't hesitate, just shoot me a mail. That said, let's get started. So first, I want to talk about WebAssembly to ensure everybody's on track and everybody can follow the samples shown in this webinar. Some key facts about WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a specification of a binary instruction format, which is designed as a portable compilation target. The resulting applications, we often call them WebAssembly modules, are executed on a stack-based virtual machine. WebAssembly has been invented for the browser, right? To bring existing legacy and intense workloads into the browser without having the need to rewrite them in JavaScript. However, WebAssembly is also available outside of the browser. The language support for WebAssembly is continuously growing and for some languages we are still in the phase of stabilizing the support for WebAssembly, which is also the fact for .NET. And the most important thing is that WASM is just another name for WebAssembly. The most important question for developers might be at this point in time, how can I create such a WebAssembly module? And the answer is fairly simple. So we start by writing our code, then we use the language specific tool chain, like for example, the compiler and compile it down to the WebAssembly platform. With the WebAssembly module in place, we can take this module and run it on a WebAssembly virtual machine. And those virtual machines are often called runtimes. There are four things that make WebAssembly great. First, WebAssembly is portable. Once we have compiled our code down to WebAssembly, our app is portable across any operating system and any architecture. We don't have to cross compile our code anymore. Second, compared to other distributable units, WebAssembly modules are super tiny. For example, if you create a non-optimized version of Hello World, and by saying non-optimized, I mean optimizing the compilation result, not the source code, right? So a non-optimized Hello World WebAssembly application is roughly about 300 kilobytes in size. If you optimize the .wasm file, you may end up with two digit kilobytes. Third is sandboxed. WebAssembly modules are executed in a strict sandbox, which means we as developers have to grant permissions to our apps in order to allow them using system resources. By saying system resources, I mean things like reading or writing to the file system, reading environment variables, or establishing a connection to a foreign host. Fourth is startup time with spin. And we will cover what spin is in a couple of seconds. We are able to cold start applications in roughly half of a millisecond. So these are four things that make WebAssembly a perfect technology for building serverless or reactive applications and run them in a high dense mode on servers or in the cloud. Next, let's talk about Spin. So Spin is the open source developer tool empowering you to build WebAssembly workloads using different programming languages. Spin itself is language agnostic, which means you have to learn only the Spin specific commands 
to build WebAssembly applications no matter if you use Rust, Go, JavaScript, Python or .NET 9. Spin itself also comes with a bunch of templates and by the way, you can roll your own templates, which streamline the developer experience in order to start from scratch. Last but not least, Spin also comes with language-specific SDKs. You can think of those SDKs as an abstraction layer on top of APIs provided either by the Spin runtime or by the WebAssembly system interface or short WASI. By using the Spin SDK, you remain productive while achieving day-to-day -day requirements. But let's have a look at how you can get started with Spin. Over here in the terminal, let's create a simple Spin application. So I have installed Spin on my machine and I can choose a template that I want to use in order to create a new application. And I accept the defaults and provide a name for my new app. We will start with Rust right now before we explore .NET 9. So let's create the app. Let's move into the folder over here and let's have a look what we get. So first and most important, we get the spin manifest, which is a TOML file where all the configuration aspects of your spin app remain. And this is also the place where language specific commands like what should happen if you ask spin to compile your app down to WebAssembly should be invoked. In the case of Rust, we execute cargo build and tell cargo that it should compile our source code for the WASM32 WASI platform in the release mode. Let's also sneak into the actual implementation. So this is an app that will be triggered by me sending an HTTP request to the app. However, instead of returning hello Fermion, let's return hello CNC app community. Let's store that and let's kill Envim and let's compile our code down to WebAssembly using spin build. So right now, all dependencies are pulled to my machine and are compiled for the WASM32 WASI platform. Let's have a look at the target WASM32 WASI release folder. And we can see there is a hello spin.wasm application, which is non-optimized. And this is roughly about 310 kilobytes in size. We can run the app locally by doing a simple spin up. And right now the spin runtime spawns up a web server on localhost 3000 and we're able to send requests to our spinner. So let's do that. Let's do curl local local host 3000 and we get back hello CNCF community. This is how easy it is to build WebAssembly applications with Spin. Let's move back to the slides and let's dive into .NET 9 in the context of WebAssembly and Spin. Before we do so, let me do some expectation management, right? So the following section, so everything that you will see from now on is based on our recent experiments. The code and the APIs that I'll demonstrate are subject to change and they will change and you will understand why. However, it's also important to understand that this is not meant to be used in production environments as of today. It's also important to understand that these experiments are not related to Microsoft's Blazor project. All right, let's get started. So why do we care so deeply about .NET that we do experiments like that? C Sharp is one of the most popular languages among application developers. It has a super huge ecosystem with millions of packages, libraries, articles, tutorials available. 
We have powerful IDEs, editors, and tools that allow us to have a great developer experience. And on top of that, we want to make .NET developers build portable, fast, and secure apps. So let's start with the good news. The .NET team is currently working on adding support for WebAssembly and the WebAssembly system interface to .NET. So they are actually implementing WASI Preview 2 with or short WASI P2 and WASI Preview 2.1 or short WASI P2.1. However, they are not yet feature complete when it comes to supporting all WASI APIs. The bad news is that code freeze for .NET 9 came too early. And that means all these efforts will not be part of the upcoming .NET 9 release. At Fermion, we hope to see support for WASI P2 and WASI P2.1 behind an experimental flag with the next .NET release, which will be .NET 10 and is set to release during fall of 2025. However, we took that work in progress from Microsoft and created a custom native AOT based LLVM compiler on top of it, where we bring in the missing parts and where we patch some defects. It's important to recognize that it is native AOT only at this point in time, which means yes, all the apps are incredibly fast. However, there are some limitations, right? So for example, in native AOT, you can't make use of unbound reflection, which is something we as developers have to be aware of. On top of that, native AOT compiled applications are usually harder to debug than mono-based applications. We consider adding support for mono in the future because this allows you to debug with ease. All right, let's explore some spin apps written in .NET. Over here, you can see that I've installed a preview of .NET 9 on my machine. And no, it does not have to be the latest one. It has to be at least preview six or newer. On top of that, I have installed the Canary or preview version of the spin CLI on my machine. Let's explore the hello world .NET 9 edition. As you can see, we have an I incoming handler interface over here, and we implement a static handle function, which receives the request over here, and also a response out object that we can use to send an HTTP response in response to an incoming HTTP request. For the sake of demonstration, this one is simply cr me creating an HTTP 200 response with text plane and responding back with hello CNCF community. This is .NET 9 compiled to WASM WASI P2. And this is what I often refer to as the .NET HTTP template, which allows you to use all the great capabilities provided through the base class library of .NET, as long as they align with the APIs provided through WASI to build your WebAssembly applications. Let's move back to the terminal and let's compile the app. Again, it is as simple as doing a spin build, which will use our private native AOT based LLVM compiler. We end up with a WebAssembly module, which is roughly about seven megabytes in size. And this is due to the fact that a subset of the .NET garbage collector is part of that WebAssembly module. We hope to see improvements in WASM GC in order to make the .NET team ditch the .NET garbage collector in favor of WASM GC, which will obviously reduce the size 
of that WebAssembly module dramatically. Now let's run this one as well using spin up. Again, the app is right now running on localhost and responding to requests hitting port 3000. Let's go to the other terminal over here and let's do a simple curl localhost 3000 again. And as you can see, we get back hello CNCF community. This is .NET 9 compiled to WASM WASI P2. So this was the .NET HTTP experience. However, we went one step further and we took ASP.NET Core and made it work seamlessly with WebAssembly. Let's explore this one as well in our editor. So first let's open up the implementation and let's see what we got. So again, we have the I incoming handler interface with that handle method. However, in contrast to the .NET experience, we use all those idioms provided by ASP.NET Core to create a web application builder. We create a slim builder over here. Then we ensure that we can use content negotiation by instructing the JSON serializer or by telling the JSON serializer which types it could serialize and deserialize because there is no unbound reflection in native AOT. Then we replace the default server with a WASI compliant HTTP server. For logging, we ensure that we log to standard out because this capability is granted access to through the WebAssembly runtime to our guest code. Then we build the app as we would normally do with ASP.NET Core. And we leverage minimal APIs. We configure static file serving over here. We have a get handler that returns some arbitrary JSON for the traditional weather forecast. And we have an echo endpoint that shows you how you can stream uh, response back to the callee. Next, I would like to add another example which shows how you can use bound serialization and register a new endpoint over here. So let's start by creating a simple class representing our request model over here that has a string called name get set and let's mark that as required over here. And we have another class which is our response model that will have a public required string. Let's call that result. For the sake of simplicity, let's implement our business logic in a public static method that returns a new instance of response model. And let's say from prefix and request model model. So those are the values that we use to compute our new response. Let's, uh, let's say res return your response model and we set the result to a template string that says prefix and a mess uh, a model model name to upper is what we want to use over there and let's add that semicolon. So those are our API models for the way in. We have that request model and for creating the response, we simply will return an instance of the response model in a minimal API handler. We have our um, JSON serializer context in order to tell the JSON serializer which types it should be able to serialize and to deserialize. So let's say JSON serializable type of, that's our request model. And we want to use that once again for our response model. All right, let's register our endpoint. Let's say app map post at greet. We want to get a request model over here. 
that is our model and we use an anonymous function to construct our HTTP response, which is a simple HTTP 200 from, and the prefix will be hello, and we pass in the model. All right, this looks good. So let's quit the editor. Let's run another spin build to compile our ASP.NET core app down to WebAssembly. And let's start the app by doing a spin up. All right, so the app is running. Let's move to another terminal instance. And let's look for a curl request where we send an HTTP post to localhost 3000 forward slash greet. We specify the content type to be at application JSON, and we specify the payload to be a JSON object with a name property set to CNCF community. And we get back hello, and then in uppercase CNCF community. Finally, let's open up Safari and let's go to localhost 3000. We get back the hello world message so we can grab my static page. So this is served using the static file middleware. Let's paste that path over there and we get back hello world. Awesome. Going back to the slides because I wanna share some additional information on that experiment. So what we got working so far is allowing you to build spin apps using the HTTP trigger, either with the plain.net approach or with the HP.net core approach, as you saw it a couple of seconds ago. We have also a preview build of the upcoming spin bin SDK for .NET, which gives you access to configuration data, to key value stores and different databases. On top of that, we are currently working on integrating or allowing you to leverage Microsoft.data.sql client, so good old ADO.NET, but there is currently upstream work happening to add TLS support in WASI sockets. And we are also working on gRPC services. So allowing you to run G or to expose gRPC services from within your spin apps built with .NET 9. There is currently some upstream work going on to add the required HTTP2 capabilities to WASI HTTP. On our roadmap is obviously a set of first class templates for .NET and SPIN. So I already talked about HTTP.NET, allowing you to build apps just with the .NET SDK. Next is HTTP ASP.NET Core that gives you like a super great experience if you have existing ASP.NET Core workloads that you may want to translate to WebAssembly or bring them to spin. And obviously we have templates using different triggers, like for example, the Redis trigger, the MQTT trigger, the Kinesis trigger, or the command trigger. And we obviously want to create templates for those kinds of triggers with .NET as well. You saw a bunch of code already today, but again, this is an experiment and we definitely want to streamline the entire DX, which means we have to take care about those ergonomics that we embrace all the language idioms that c -sharp offers and also make the experimental spin SDK for .NET feel like a base class capabilities provided by .NET itself. As you saw earlier in the demos, there's still some infrastructural code in the spin apps and we try to minimize that as much as possible so that you can focus on solving real world problems instead of taming the infrastructure. Obviously, we want to give you a great IDE based debugging experience, but this is something that requires us to support Mono and to get some work done in WASI sockets. 
With that, there are a couple of resources if you want to dive deeper into spin and especially into the experimental spin SDK 4.net. So this one is at https github.com dicej forward slash spin dash dot net dash SDK. And also a great shout out to componentize.net, which is a project under the Bytecode Alliance. So also check out that one because that was basically one of the foundations we built on top of. Thank you for your attention and see you next time.